Welcome everyone to our webinar today, Fall Prevention and Naturopathic Medicine, presented by the Fall Prevention Community of Practice. My name is Lindsay Toth, and I am a project coordinator at the Ontario Neurotrauma Foundation. ONF sponsors LOOP and the Community of Practice, or COP. Marguerite Thomas also joins us on the line today. Marguerite Thomas is the coordinator of the Fall Prevention Community of Practice and will be assisting with the webinar technology. Before we begin, I'm going to give you a quick rundown on the Level 3 web meeting system. This webinar technology consists of two parts. The audio is provided through a telephone conference line, and the visuals are provided through a web platform. The phone number for the conference line and the link for the web platform were sent to you by email after you registered for the webinar with Level 3. If you have questions about the technology at any time during this presentation, please type them into the chat box located on the left-hand side of your screen. Alternatively, you can send me an email to lindsay at onf.org. We will work with you to resolve technical issues as soon as possible. This webinar will contain opportunities for participation. There will be um, a question and answer period at the end, and we encourage you to type your questions during the presentation into the chat box. We will flag them and then read them aloud at the end to the presenter. We will also give you the opportunity to unmute your phone line at the end and answer, ask your question over the phone if you prefer. I would now like to introduce our speaker for today. We have Dr. Cara Dionysio. Um, and she is a naturopathic doctor. So, Kara, you may now unmute your phone line by dialing star 7 and take it away. Hello. Can everyone hear me? We can. Great. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, so, hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, it's really my pleasure to um, be speaking with you here today. And from what I'm learning about the fall prevention community of practice, I really love the idea of forming a community around a particular health goal, and I really uh, wish those communities existed for a lot of other conditions. So um, I can see how great ideas and collaborations really can come from this. Um, before we start, I'd like to thank a couple people, especially Emily Powell for connecting me with you today. She's a health promoter at the Gray Bruce Health Unit. And a huge thank you uh, to Mary Beth Forget, who is your uh, information specialist and uh, library services, and she has been a fantastic resource for me, and uh, I have definitely put her hard to work. So thank you, Mary Beth. So today, um, just a clarification, I am definitely no expert in false prevention, and when I was asked to do this talk, I thought, what will I talk about? Um, but I was intrigued at the challenge of discovering uh, possible contributions to naturopathic, that naturopathic medicine can make to this topic. And then once I got into the meat of it, I soon realized that I probably could talk at length about many of the subpoints we're going to talk about today. Um, so hopefully we can get through it. Um, but I've decided what we should focus on today is health conditions that may significantly increase the risk of falling and naturopathic strategies that can help to uh, reduce, prevent, or treat those conditions. Um, we're going to go through um, just a brief overview of what naturopathic medicine is, assessment of falls, we'll go through uh, nutrition in older adults, um, medical conditions associated with fall risk, as well as um, throughout there will be um, some slides on medications um, and fall risk and some possible naturopathic um, alternatives. I'm going to skip this slide for now. So, a bit of foreshadowing here, just to give you a little bit of background on myself. Um, this is my, a photo of me at my grade, science, uh, grade 5 science fair. Um, the topic was protein. So, um, you would think it, I was destined to become a naturopathic doctor, but that certainly wasn't on my radar. I come from a very, very medical family, lots of Lots of people in our family are doctors or everyone else is health professionals um, in some capacity. So this wasn't really on my radar until I went to the University of Guelph and I took uh, some nutrition programs. And that really opened my eyes to how essential nutrition is to health and disease prevention. So that kind of started my journey. I went to the University of Aberdeen then and continued my studies in nutrition 
and did my master's there, found my awesome husband, and then I went to Toronto to the Canadian College of Naturopathic Medicine to uh, do the four-year program in naturopathic medicine. So, what is naturopathic medicine? There's a lot of uh, a lot of people who don't know much about it, and other people who have lots of misconceptions. So, uh, oh, let me advance the slide here. There we go. So, naturopathic medicine is a primary healthcare system that blends modern medical knowledge with a holistic, natural approach to the assessment, diagnosis, and treatment of an individual. So we do this by focusing on prevention and treating the underlying cause of disease. And you'll see what I mean by that um, as we go through a lot of the, um, of the presentation today. We have extensive training in both conventional and natural medicine. Um, and so some of the tools I use with my patients, um, every patient gets primary nutrition um, education. We work on just changing their diets for the better, lifestyle counseling, exercise counseling, working on sleeping and stress management. Um, and do naturopathic doctors are great at acupuncture, so we always incorporate that. And we're also very well versed in the safe, safe prescription of natural therapeutics and herbs. Um, so that's kind of some of the toolbox we use, but really the important part is how we just look at a medical case. So in Ontario, naturopathic doctors are regulated, a regulated health profession under the RHPA um, and governed by the College of Naturopaths of Ontario. Um, and this has made naturopathic medicine a very safe uh, choice of health care for Canadians. Um, and in July 2015, um, when this bill was passed, we were offered a com comprehensive scope of practice, access to lab testing, and a few prescription drugs. But really, it was a really great thing that uh, we were able to, to go under the umbrella of a regulated health profession. So some misconceptions about naturopathic medicine. Um, to quote Kermit the Frog, it is not easy being green. <laughs> I've had to grow a bit of a professional thick skin since um, there are some, some, some definite misconceptions about uh, what I do, and I wanted to take the opportunity today just to clear up a few of those. Um, so the first one is that it's not evidence-based. And... Um, a great quote I like from Carl Sagan is, the absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence. So sometimes, you know, in, in medicine, we're very into evidence-based medicine. Um, it's become a stiff standard um, that we base our clinical decisions on, but sometimes I think we are maybe a victim of its design. Um, Industry-funded studies have significantly higher chance of showing positive results. Um, and there's other problems too. And I love how the community of practice here for falls prevention uses the term evidence informed. And I think that that's um, a really great, uh, great way to put it because I think it encourages some open mindedness and more exploration. Um, and also, like, there's a higher chance that we are going to get um, studies funded for, for example, a pharmaceutical drug for lowering blood pressure. Um, versus maybe a study designed to look at how beet juice might reduce blood pressure. And um, that's actually a true story. If you look at the evidence, there is evidence that beet juice will reduce blood pressure, and I use it with my patients all the time. But the study funding for that is probably uh, pretty minimal. Um, other misconceptions is that it's alternative or complementary. Um, and Or complementary alternative medicine is a term that's, that's used quite often, um, but make no mistake about it, what I do is not alternative, nor is it complementary. Um, and unless we're really talking about um, acute emergency care, um, what I do should not be the second choice. And in fact, I argue it should be the gold standard first line therapy. Um, and you'll see that examples come out um, as we go through. Um, and also, it's not about being natural. Um, there's, uh, I actually don't really care too much if something's natural or a drug. Um, the point of naturopathic medicine is more about the approach and treatment to disease and looking at what's going on really underneath instead of covering up the symptoms. 
and I love to collaborate. I love to work with people. It's sometimes that they won't want to work with me, um, but actually that's not usually the case. Unfortunately, we aren't too well hooked into the medical system, so um, for example, I can't refer to a medical doctor, um, but uh, I definitely use lots of my um, physiotherapy, occupational therapy, massage therapists, you know, lots of referrals um, in more of the private sector. All right, let's get into the meat of naturopathic medicine and fall prevention. My computer's just lagging here for a second. Okay, mine, mine, okay, there we go. So assessment of fall risk in naturopathic medicine um, is probably very similar to what a lot of um, other primary health care practitioners are using. Um, naturopathic uh, visits are very comprehensive. We have the benefit of time, which is a real great luxury. Um, our appointments are pretty long and we get to know our patients really well. Um, we, get, we take a full medical history and then fall specific risk assessment um, is going to be similar to PT or OT. Um, we're definitely maybe not as good at it, um, and so I would bring those, those uh, other health professionals in um, for assessment uh, to help me out as well. Uh, some more specific things we might do. Um, I'll either have my patients bring in their lab tests or I'll usually run uh, some basic lab testing on my patients. Um, specific to fall risk, vitamin D, B12, iron, um, and some inflammatory markers um, are important. And physical exam, um, I do an orthostatic blood pressure on a lot of my patients, and that's uh, something that usually hasn't, they haven't had done before, so um, I find that one can be quite interesting. Um, just other general waist tip, uh, BMI, um, just assessment of muscle mass, and hair, skin, and nail exam can be really important in, uh, in functional nutrition evaluation. And I've got some really cool um, assessment tools for hair, skin, and nail that relate back to nutritional deficiency. So if anyone's interested in those, I can pass those along. Um, nutritional assessment, we'll do a full diet diary, maybe a seven-day one or a three-day one, just to really see what people are eating. And the other benefit of that is the simple act of writing down what you're eating tends to... Uh, automatically improve people's diets. And I just love that I get to get into really great conversations about um, my patients' overall health, going through stress, mental health, uh, spirituality, um, social, uh, financial hobbies. Um, so that's kind of the fun part of my patient interactions. All right, so I'm sure many of you are involved in programs that are aimed at helping um, the nutritional status of um, older Canadians. Um, adults later in life are definitely very vulnerable to poor nutritional status. And poor nutritional status in, um, at any age, but especially in older age, um, is associated with higher death rates, longer stays in hospital, um, more complications, more increased risk of infection, um, and things like that. So it really is um, an important uh, thing to address. And I'm sure uh, many of you are familiar with j just why there are risk factors for developing uh, malnutrition. So, you know, we look at physiological changes, appetite, sen senses, digestion, um, any other medical conditions, um, you know, poor dentition, vision, um, mental, emotional health, um, and medications. Also just things like mobility is huge or access to grocery stores, um, access to transportation are all going to have an impact on um, nutrition and the ability to eat well. So some of the key points when I was trying to decide how to talk about nutrition and fall prevention, um, you may have expected, or I certainly at the beginning expected that I would kind of go through a list of vitamins and minerals and how they relate back to fall prevention. And then I started thinking that's probably a very reductionistic, reductionistic approach um, for 
an issue that's so complex and multifactorial like fall risk um, that really is built up of uh, lifetime factors, chronic factors, social factors, medications. And so focusing on single nutrients is really probably not going to get us um, any meaningful answers. Rather, it's more about overall nutritional health and its effect on you know, things like weakness and muscle strength. Um, that's where we can get um, more meaningful, um, bigger impact, I should say. So I don't know about you, but the first thing I sometimes think about when I'm thinking about nutrition in older adults is this. And from a primary health uh, care perspective, um, this product, um, I won't call it a food, has become synonymous, synonymous with nutrition for our seniors. Um, many of my older patients have been told to have Boost or Ensure, um, often by their doctors. Um, and I wanted just to give you a snapshot of what this um, contains in this nutritional beverage. So the first three ingredients, water, sugar, and corn syrup, yum. Um, on average, uh, for a booster insurer, imagine starting with just like a baking cup or like one cup of water, 250 mils or so. And then you're going to stir in about six or seven teaspoons of sugar and corn syrup. Um, and just for comparison, in 330 mils of Coke, there is 10 teaspoons of sugar. So we're not doing much better there, but at least Coke isn't masquerading as a health drink. Um, then adding in a thickening agent like carrageenan, and if you haven't heard about carrageenan, it's an interesting one to look up. Um, it basically rips holes in your guts. It's linked to ulceration and cancer of the GI tract and impairs insulin sensitivity, and uh, it's a, a nasty agent. Um, and just a tip, if you are drinking uh, almond milk or coconut milk or other milk alternatives, a lot of them will have this thickening agent in it, um, except for the brand Silk. So if you're drinking those, you want to definitely buy the Silk brand. Um, so that's the base. So no matter what you add to it, and in this case they're adding some synthetic vitamins and low absorbable forms and not very much, there is no way that this can ever um, be taken as nutrition. Um, and I do understand it's cheap, it's easy, there's definitely social and financial considerations we need to consider, but this isn't nutrition and we can do better than this for our older Canadians. So what is good nutrition? Um, there's definitely lots of controversy, differing opinions when it comes to nutrition. Um, even I get caught up in figuring it all out sometimes. Um, and the Canada Food Guide isn't really a great answer. Um, they're actually in consultations right now to overhaul it, and it needs a massive overhaul. Um, and so my approach to nutrition after my big journey and with all the knowledge I have, it has, has really come back to simplifying it. Um, and it may sound quite boring, but uh, my approach is eat real foods, eat mostly plants, fruits and vegetables as your base, add in some great nuts, seeds, healthy, good quality meat, um, lots of great fats, don't be afraid of fat, um, test foods, see how your body reacts. If you don't do well with gluten, don't eat it. If you don't do well with dairy, don't eat it. Um, you know, listen to your body and tell, it will tell you what it, what it likes and what it doesn't. Um, and with my patients, I just really work with where they are. And instead of making massive overhauls, what we'll do is we'll just say, for example, for the next month, we're going to try these different breakfasts or, um, you know, let's try these snacks and really just slowly work towards a lifelong, sustainable, healthy diet. Um, and I'm really big on habit change. So if, if that's something that you're interested in, um, there's a great book um, called The Power of Habits, and it's by Charles Duhigg. And it really goes into some of the cool science about how we can sustain habit changes. Okay, um, so this is a favorite topic of mine. Um, so hold on here. <laughs> um, so proton pump inhibitors. These are drugs that are used to reduce stomach acid. Um, they're one of the top five most prescribed drugs in Canada. Uh, lots of people are on them. 
There definitely are some clinically relevant uses and needed uses, things like Barrett's esophagus um, or H. pylori, where we do need these medications. Unfortunately, what's happening, though, is they're commonly prescribed for just general indigestion. Um, you know, heartburn, reflux, um, but generally, patients are going into their doctors with general indigestion, and instead of getting kind of nutrition advice or changing diet, um, these, these drugs are prescribed a little bit too much. So it's estimated that about 40% of patients don't have an evidence-based reason for taking proton pump inhibitors. Um, and Health Canada has come out with warnings saying they should be prescribed at the lowest dose for the shortest amount of time. But that's not what's happening. Um, in Canada. I mean, I see a lot of patients who have been on these for one year, two years, five years, ten years, and, and, and more. And so um, that's a problem, and so we'll, we're going to go through reasons why that is actually a huge problem. Um, so adverse effects associated with proton pump inhibitors. Um, the references are there for you. Um, let's read the rap sheet. So fracture, osteoporosis, increased bone density and strength, um, increased risk of C. difficile and the diarrhea associated with that, um, increased risk of hospital and community acquired pneumonia, chronic kidney disease, um, severe hypomagnesia, which is a huge one, B12 deficiency, 44% uh, increased chance of dementia and reduced diversity of good gut bacteria. Um, and so if you look at this list, um, it's quite striking because every single one of those will impact fall risk. So fractures, uh, bone density, um, you might get pneumonia or an intestinal defection or um, the diarrhea associated with that. Um, prescribed antibiotics um, or having to rush to the washroom. Um, hypomagnesia in particular, we'll talk a bit about magnesium later on again too, but that might lead to muscle spasm, pain, um, sleep disturbances, headaches, um, and then subsequent medications that come with that. Um, and B12 de deficiency can be um, associated with um, kind of nerve issues like neuralgia or paresthesia. Um, so that's pretty significant, and um, they're really hard to get off. Once you have blocked your acid, as soon as you try to get off of it, your stomach really feels like it's on fire. So um, getting off of these requires some pretty decent di diet changes. Um, there's a great resource called deprescribing.org that has some really good um, evidence-based templates for how to, um, to, to change these. And uh, it would be a whole other presentation to how to, uh, that I could let you know how to deal with heartburn or reflex. Um, but uh, if you're interested, I can maybe send you some resources on that. Okay, so this is a great list um, of factors that increase fall prevention. So what I thought we would do for the rest of the presentation today is review approaches, uh, naturopathic pr approaches for conditions that have a high odds ratio um, of fall risk. Um, so you'll hear me say the words odd ratio um, a few times here. And so for some of you who haven't done some statistics for a while, an odd ratio represents the odds that an outcome will occur given a particular exposure. So uh, let's say, for example, um, the risk of falling in patients with Alzheimer's disease has an odds ratio of two. So in other words, Alzheimer's disease is associated with a doubled risk of falling. So that's kind of how odds ratios work. And I thought it was a good basic, um, a good way to relate back the chronic health conditions and their risk, um, how they increase the risk of falls. Okay, so sarcopenia, you can see in the top corner there's a little yellow star. Um, and if we go back to that list, we can see that sarcopenia um, has an odds ratio of five for increasing fall risk. And that's pretty much the highest odds ratio I've seen. Um, so it's a really great disease to highlight the effects of, um, of malnutrition on fall risk because malnutrition will lead to sarcopenia. 
So the criteria for sarcopenia is the presence of low skeletal muscle mass, and they're also expanding the definition to include low muscle strength or low muscle performance. Um, and so when all of these conditions are present, that constitutes a, a pretty severe um, sarcopenia. So sarcopenia is a huge factor for falls. Um, there's a couple other odds and hazard ratios there. Um, and sarcopenia doesn't always necessarily mean um, underweight and frail. So um, we can have patients who are also um, overweight or obese, um, but also have um, a low muscle mass. So, um, and this, this situation where you have a low muscle mass or sarcopenia plus um, obesity, and in particular central or abdominal obesity, um, seems to be the highest risk. So um, overnutrition is actually malnutrition in this case. So uh, the Society for Sarcopenia, Cachexia, and Wasting Disease has an expert panel, um, and they have uh, three basic categories for um, treating sarcopenia. So we're going to go through all three of these, exercise, protein, and vitamin D. Okay, so exercise. Um, I'm going to leave the details of this uh, to my uh, OT and PT colleagues um, that are more um, up on this area. Um, I went to uh, a great workshop at the Grapers Health Unit um, last year, and uh, Caitlin MacArthur of uh, Two, Fit to, uh, Two Fit to Fracture program uh, did a great presentation on all the uh, evidence of exercise and fall prevention. So um, that was really um, a, a great in-depth uh, resource for that. Um, with my patients, I really start with where they are, and we just work uh, to, towards making changes just to be more active, um, encouraging group programs, um, local programs, um, and uh, group classes and things like that. Uh, so protein is a really important uh, component to this. Um, older adults have an increased requirement, um, and older, per older persons also produce less muscle um, on the same amount of dietary protein, so um, that really does bump up the, their requirements. Um, and older adults with a higher protein intake lost about 40% appendicular lean mass than those um, in the lowest uh, protein intake category. So the general recommendations that came out of this consensus were 1 to 1.5 grams of protein per kilograms per day. Um, so for example, that's um, say someone is about 150 pounds, that represents about 68 to 100 grams of protein in a day. And that's actually quite a mighty goal. Um, and that protein needs to be uh, spread throughout the day in order for it to be kind of absorbed and utilized better. Um, and also the key thing about protein is if you're going to be exercising, we need the protein requirements to be there in order to get the uh, benefit of the exercise. There's one particular amino acid that seems to be, um, uh, well, that is more essential um, and uh, because essential amino acids are the primary stimulus um, for protein synthesis. And leucine appears to be um, a more potent um, amino acid in producing anabolic effects in muscle. Um, and these essential amino acids act uh, together with exercise to increase protein synthesis. So this meta-analysis here showed that a supplement with leucine um, increased body weight, lean muscle mass, and uh, was actually more beneficial in patients who already had sarcopenia. Um, I don't usually supplement with leucine um, specifically, um, but I may get patients on a really good quality um, uh, protein shake, just making a, a, a protein smoothie. In particular, whey protein is quite high in leucine, so that's usually how I would do it. And then here's our friend, vitamin D. Um, so vitamin D will decline with aging, um, probably associated with, um, with 
older adults perhaps not getting the same amount of sun exposure. Um, and so the consensus here is that we need to replace vitamin D in persons with low levels. Um, and by doing so, um, increasing levels to adequate will restore strength and function, um, decrease fall risk by about 20%, and also is, a, is associated with lower mortality. So the recommendation here is that uh, 25-hydroxy vitamin D levels should be measured in all patients with sarcopenia. Um, and that vitamin D should be supplemented um, when values are less than 100. I run this lab on many of my patients, if not most. Um, OHIP no longer covers the cost of testing of this unless you have uh, specific diseases, and they will cover it. Um, but they delisted it because apparently it's not medically necessary, which I hope we all may disagree about that. And then some cool studies on omega-3 and sarcopenia. Um, you know, this, this uh, RCT was showing that fish oil um, increased thigh muscle volume, hand grip strength, and uh, our one range of motion, or sorry, one repetition of muscle strength as well. Um, and so those were quite significant. The mechanisms there are not fully understood, but we're thinking that omega-3 increases the rate of of uh, muscle protein synthesis and slows the breakdown of, of, uh, of muscle as well. Um, I think I'll go from this slide. This is really just a, an overview of some of the things we talked about for sarcopenia. So we will move on to other chronic diseases. So the risk of falling and sustaining a fall related um, and sustaining a fall-related injury um, does increase with the number of chronic health problems you have. Um, and as we all know, if you have one chronic disease, oftentimes um, other ones will go along with it. Um, so you can see there the odds ratio increases as your number of chronic disease does. And so we know in Canada, chronic disease is a major problem and will continue to be as our population um, grows and ages. Uh, one of my favorite uh, statistics, in fact, I actually would call it a motivational quote, um, is from the World Health Organization. Um, and they estimate that 40% of all cancers, 80% of all premature cardiovascular disease, 80% of stroke and 80% of type 2 diabetes can be prevented if we improve diet, become more physically active, stop smoking, and avoid excess of alcohol. So those four things will make significant impact. Um, there's not a drug in the world that can be that powerful. Um, so what we're talking about today is not an alternative, it is first-line therapy. So just quickly here, when we're going through some of the chronic diseases, um, you're going to hear me talk about underlying causes, and these are some of the big ones that I'm looking for in my patients with chronic disease. So looking at the gut, looking at insulin resistance, um, inflammation, and oxidative stress. Okay, so arthritis. Um, I've kind of grouped osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis together here, um, but both are, increased, uh, are associated with increased fall risk. Um, for osteoarthritis, the number of joints affected um, significantly um, increases the chance of falling, um, and in particular, if the arthritis is of the knee or hip. Um, the studies on RA for fall risk, um, I couldn't seem to find as convincing evidence, but there definitely was um, convincing evidence for um, ankle and foot joint affected by RA and the increased risk of falls. Um, I'll go through this quickly. As you can tell, I'm a little passionate about underlying causes, so I could talk about it for too long, but for, for osteoarthritis, um, degeneration is it's kind of a degenerative disease, but there definitely is an inflammatory component. And then for rheumatoid arthritis, it is an autoimmune disorder. And any time in practice that I see an autoimmune disorder, doesn't matter if it's RA, hypothyroidism, uh, psoriasis, um, 
I always go back to the gut, go back to the intestinal barrier, um, go back to underlying infections. Um, those three things seem to be uh, play a primary drivers for, for all autoimmune diseases. So arthritis and diet, some good studies. The Mediterranean diet really kind of comes up trump for a lot of chronic diseases, improving quality of life, pain, disability, um, associated with um, osteoarthritis. Um, and so we're just going to reduce foods in the diet um, that promote inflammation and just eat tons of fruits and vegetables, lots of different varieties and colors. Um, and that seems to be, um, that's probably the reason why the Mediterranean diet is so effective for arthritis. So here's a snapshot of some of the nutritional therapeutics I may use for arthritis. As I said, um, you know, this is a very quick overview, um, but I was intrigued by um, the research that was um, behind a lot of these supplements that I would use for my patients. So curcumin is the active component from turmeric. Meta-analysis of eight trials um, showed that curcumin reduced joint arthritis symptoms similar to the effects of um, some you know, mild pain medications. Um, another one called SAMe, a meta-analysis of 11 trials as effective as NSAIDs for improving pain and function in um, osteoarthritis. Um, another one, Boswellia, which is a tree native to Africa and the Middle East. Um, it's where um, I think Indian frankincense is from. And the components, five loxin out of that are very anti-inflammatory and have been shown to improve pain and function in osteoarthritis, as well as um, our good friend, omega-3. So about two to three grams a day for three months, reduced um, NSAID consumption by those with rheumatoid arthritis. So acupuncture is kind of a go-to for, for anyone with arthritis. Um, I may do it myself or uh, refer on to physiotherapy. Um, and so a meta-analysis of 12 trials, significant reductions in pain, improved functional mobility, and quality of life. And I also would say it's got some really good uh, neurological kind of um, stress reduction um, resetting effects too. So for the mental emotional component of chronic disease, it's, uh, it's, that's another benefit of acupuncture. Okay, so depression. Um, so depression and fall risk. Um, For older adults, starting home health care doubles the risk of adverse uh, fall events. So um, it can be a risk for falls. Um, but in particular, something I didn't really realize was the effect of antidepressant medications on fall risk. So um, SSRIs, or, serotonin select or selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, will, um, are actually considered an independent risk factor for falls and fracture due to falls. Um, and so that was something I've learned from doing this, and it's a, certainly a drug class that um, is, is quite, quite common. So nutrition, um, again, the Mediterranean diet has been really um, effective for most chronic diseases. Dietary fish intake is associated with lower risk of depression and uh, just really a healthy dietary pattern um, as well. And this slide is really pretty cool. Um, so this was a eight-week study on probiotic supplementation in patients with um, major depressive disorder. And um, the results were really interesting. So decreased depression scores, decreased serum insulin levels, decreased insulin resistance, decreased um, CRP, and increased levels of um, glutathione, which is a master antioxidant. So um, that is really cool because that almost intersects 
the underlying causes of gut health, brain health, inflammation, oxidative stress, insulin resistance. Um, and so it kind of brings everything together, which, is, which I think is really pretty cool. I won't talk too much about this one, but the evidence coming out on the use of saffron, which is a spice, is, is really promising. Um, some of the studies showing it as effective as uh, citalopram or fluoxetine, um, and so a lot of studies are showing that it has similar activity to antidepressant medication. The problem with this one is I cannot source it very well. Um, I can't find a good quality extract in Canada, but I have a feeling with the research coming out that that's not uh, too far away. Um, and same with curcumin, um, and curcumin and saffron seem to, to uh, work very well, very well together. There is a theory in depression that, um, that the hormone or neurotransmitter theory is, is maybe a little bit lacking, and we're wondering if antidepressant medications are working because they also have anti-inflammatory um, properties. Um, and that's an interesting way to look at it. So in depression, it's really important with our patients that we're talking about, um, actually with any patient, but um, talking about mind-body medicine, um, you know, relaxation and um, things like that. So Tai Chi has really great positive studies for depression. Um, but also for fall prevention, um, the, there's great evidence for Tai Chi and fall prevention. Also cognitive performance, arthritis, um, and all of these things are independent factors for fall. So Tai Chi is a really great um, option for people. Um, Owen Sound has some really great Tai Chi groups for, for uh, um, older adults, so I often recommend those. Um, meditation and mindful-based programs. You can see me here using my Muse Meditation um, headband, um, which uh, really helps me with my focus and creativity. If you're interested in how that works, then message me and I can uh, talk about it. Um, pretty cool science out of McMaster. It uses EEG technology to basically sense my brain and how calm it is. Um, and I'm using that with patients, which is really fun. Um, well, I realize we are running out of time very quickly. Dementia, here's two slides, but uh, this is a big one. It basically doubles fall risk um, for many reasons that we can, um, we can are pretty obvious. Um, this study is really cool on the MIND diet. Um, this was developed out of uh, Rush University Medical Center, and it's basically a combination of the Mediterranean diet and the DASH diet. Um, and so by following this diet, um, strictly, it reduced the risk of Alzheimer's disease by 53%. And those who even moderately followed it had a reduced risk of Alzheimer's disease by 35%. So again, no drug in the world will do that. Diet and nutrition throughout life is really the approach that we need to be taking. All right. I have some slides here on diabetes and sleep, and I think I'm going to uh, I'm going to skip those for day, today in the interest of time. And there's actually a lot in the presentation. I also cut out osteoporosis, which for me was a bit more controversial. My recommendations go a little bit against the grain with that one, so I left that one out. Um, but I think what we'll do is we will advance uh, to the end so that we have time for questions. Um, and so just as a, kind of an overview in bringing all of this back together. One sec, I'm just trying to find the right slide here. So I 
computer's lagging a bit. Give me one minute. shown you a few things today. I apologize I didn't get to the whole presentation, um, but I really hope that I've shown you that naturopathic doctors can be, um, can really participate in fall prevention in a meaningful way. Um, I hope maybe I've changed your perception of naturopathic medicine just a little bit, um, and I hope I've explored maybe a new angle or a new topic of fall prevention that perhaps you hadn't thought about. Um, or piqued your interest in a new area. And I hope I've explained how NDs um, will look at underlying processes, um, things like gut health and inflammation and um, insulin resistance. And perhaps I've even inspired you to make a change for yourself that you know that you need to make. So thank you so much for your time today. Um, take care of yourselves, take care of your families. As healthcare professionals um, or working in healthcare, we need to be healthy and happy in order to continue doing the awesome work um, that we're doing. Um, health not found in a bottle. It is made up of the choices you make every single day, so make those choices count um, and do something today that your future self will thank you for. Thanks very much, and I am very happy to take some questions. Thank you so much, Kara. That was a fantastic presentation, and we have tons of questions, and clearly you could go on and on, and I think our audience would continue to listen because uh, everyone was just sort of enthralled with that. Um, so we're going to start in the chat box and work our way through some of those questions, and then I'll give the opportunity to unmute the phone lines if we have more questions. So please do take a moment, type up your questions, throw it in the chat box if you have something you'd like to ask um, Kara. All right, so our first question is from Julia. Um, could you include the name of the ingredient in Boost and Almond Milk in the post-webinar package? Um, and I don't know if you want to say anything additional about um, that ingredient. Sure. Um, I can get Mary Beth to include that, um, but it is called Carrageenan, C-A-R-A-G-E-E-N-A-N. -E -E Perfect. Okay, another question in the chat box from Anik. Could you clarify what vitamin D25OH means? Sure. Um, sorry about that. I included that for any uh, practitioners who are ordering labs. So um, on a lab requisition, there's two types of vitamin D we can test, but it's the, um, a specific form of vitamin D called 25-hydroxy um, that we would test in the blood. Um, and so it just, it's kind of just a specific lab annotation that we would use. Great. Um, from Shannon, what would be a substitute for whey protein in shakes for, um, for vegans? For vegans? Um, so the whey was great for, because it has a, light, a high leucine content, although I'm pretty sure a vegan protein would also um, have that. I'm just not sure of um, how much leucine it would have. Um, my favorite vegan protein is uh, by Genuine Health. It's a uh, raw fermented vegan protein, um, and that's a really, uh, really great protein. Um, the other really good uh, one for vegans is uh, called Sun Warrior, um, raw vegan protein. Again, no fillers, no, nothing in it, just really good, uh, good stuff. So those two are my favorites. Fantastic. Um, a question from Julia. Many of the statistics, statistics you shared reference Smith 2016. Could you share the full reference with us? Um, so, sorry, I didn't hear that. The reference uh, was Smith 2016. You know what? We're going to have to uh, leave that to Mary Beth. She will be sending out a resource list in a couple days, um, and that's going to have all of the references I used for the presentation, which is actually over 100 references. So off the top of my head, I can't even remember what uh, that one is in particular. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, our next question, uh, does ginger have a proven anti-inflammatory effect? Yes, definitely. It actually got the cut for um, arthritis, uh, but there are some trials on arthritis and ginger. Um, 
and for other conditions as well. Um, it just, the evidence wasn't quite as strong as some of the other ones on the slide, but yes, ginger um, has some great anti-inflammatory um, and anti-nausea effects too. Great. Um, a question from Julia. Is there an online resource that would flag if any naturopathic medications would have known side effects or interactions with prescription medications? Yes, definitely. Um, the one I use is actually free. Um, if you give me one sec, let me just find it on my bookmarks. The one by um, the one by drugs.com um, is, you know, it has mostly medications, but it does have a lot of the very common natural um, therapies. So it'll have most herbs and uh, nutrients. Um, so you just can put in all of the medications you're taking, and also put in things like omega-3, vitamin D, uh, St. John's Wort, and it will pop up with warnings um, if. If, uh, if you have, if there are contraindications or, or conflicts with them. Um, that's the one that's most available online. I certainly have um, other books and stuff, but that one's available to everybody. So if you just go drugs.com and drug interaction checker, um, it's pretty thorough. All right, maybe uh, Marguerite could throw that up in the chat box if possible. Sure. Okay, more questions in the chat box. They just keep coming. <laughs> Does vitamin B complex have a positive effect um, with depression? Uh, yes, it does. Um, the studies are mostly uh, things like seasonal affective disorder, postnatal depression, um, I believe on uh, anxiety and major depressive disorder as well. Um, yeah, so for a lot of different categories and types of depression, there is uh, there is evidence for vitamin D, um, and in particular, just it, in particular for patients or people who are deficient. But I would have to say, 90% of the people I'm testing, um, if they're not on a vitamin D supplement, are going to be deficient. Um, the reference range is 75 to 250. Um, most people I'm testing who are not taking vitamin D are well under 75, and even if they're taking 1,000 IU of vitamin D, um, they're not much over the 75. So uh, that kind of goes back to the importance of getting your labs tested, adjusting the dose, and taking the right dose for you. Great. Um, there were a few people who are interested in getting the information about the Muse meditation headband, um, so maybe we can send that out afterwards. And there was also someone uh, interested in the reference for the book uh, about habits. Sure. Forming habits. So um, we'll send both of those things out uh, with more information in the follow-up email, which should be coming to everyone in about a week or so. Perfect. Yeah, I can include the website for the Muse, or if you're interested, um, you can also, my email's there, pop me an email. Um, and uh, I can let you know my experience with it as well. Great. Um, do you have any recommendations for dealing with sugar cravings? Oh, <laughs> um, I know. I yeah, that's know the a answer big one. That. <laughs> um, very common. A lot of my patients come in and just say, uh, "Sugar is a monster, and I can't control it." Um, and I get it. I am definitely a, a have that tendency. Um, my best advice isn't very much fun, but give it three or four days and just take it out of your diet because you really got to just reset yourself and you'll be amazed after about three or four days that those cravings just really um, are kind of actually go away. Um, and I'm not saying that you can never eat sugar ever again, but really to kick it in the first place. Um, it is quite remarkable that by taking it out, you, those cravings uh, go down. And then even if you add in a little bit more um, later on, it, they seem to be a lot more manageable. But there's a lot of other strategies that um, would be hard to get into right now. Actually, the other, the other thing is just if you're eating sugar, if you know you're going to be eating sugar, just make sure you're having a protein source with it, and that seems to blunt that uh, 
huge spike of uh, blood sugar and, uh, and um, help throughout the day if you have some protein with your sugar. Fantastic. Thank you. Very useful information. Um, do you have any suggestions for rheumatoid arthritis? Yeah, rheumatoid arthritis, um, that's a tricky one, especially for me in clinical practice. Um, it's one I don't fool around with, um, only because once someone is, is diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis, I really don't want to fool around with, because um, once the joint destruction sets in, that's something that's not reversible. So it's a, a condition where I'm, I'm definitely referring out to, uh, you know, they probably already have a referral for a rheumatologist, although that can take a while. Um, I really love referring to advanced practice arthritis practitioners um, who are usually uh, PTs or OTs, and they are a free resource. Um, you don't need a referral, and uh, they have been kind of an ally for my patients. So um, that's the one side of the coin. But again, for rheumatoid arthritis, um, I address it as an autoimmune condition, so I go right back to the gut, um, kind of make sure the lining of the gut's healthy and happy and um, there's a great resource in the package uh, you'll, you'll see on um, intestinal permeability, and that is basically the fancy word for leaky gut, and, and uh, that's a really cool resource. But, yeah, I look at the underlying causes of autoimmune disease, and um, it's really hard to, to make any specific recommendations because um, it's a huge topic. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, so, of course, you teased us a little bit by saying your thoughts on bone health and osteo or osteoporosis were a little bit controversial. Um, so we have had a few people asking just to sort of know what those thoughts were um, and what your recommendations in your practice are. So I, we only have a few minutes left, so I don't know how large of a topic it is, if you want to get into it now. Um, but maybe alternatively, if you had some information that we could send out in the package that people who were interested in sort of knowing your stance and your recommendations could access more information. Okay. <laughs> um, what I will say about osteoporosis, um, what will I say? Uh, I, think, I think as a naturopath, it, the issue comes back to calcium and dairy. Um, and so that's where the controversy lies because a lot of osteoporosis research um, focuses on, you know, healthy calcium levels and requiring, you know, two, three servings of dairy in a day. Um, and when I'm working, working with my patients, and a, not, a lot of naturopaths would be similar, um, I am not a fan of dairy in general. Um, it's great for baby cows, but not great for people. And uh, so it kind of comes, there's a bit of a, uh, of a, a difference of opinion there. And I think, uh, you know, calcium status and things like that can be, can be done without uh, dairy, and a lot of people know they can't have it. You know, they've got gut issues or chronic sinusitis or uh, constipation, all really, you know, that are improved overnight without, by taking dairy, if that's the problem. So, um, yeah, just a lot of those themes of dairy, calcium, where you can get it, um, and things like that just go against some of the recommendations, uh, standard recommendations for uh, preventing um, osteoporosis. All right, that was very good, thank you. Okay. <laughs> and I think we have a few people who are thinking about their own New Year's resolutions on the webinar today because we have another question about what to do about craving carbs. Okay, so uh, very similar, I think, to the sugar one before. Um, I don't know how much I can get into it. I would maybe just say find a great naturopath in your area um, and I will give a little tough love to my profession. Not all NDs are, um, we're all very different, so you want to find one that works well for you. Um, and if you want to find a great one in your area, send me an email and I will work with you to find uh, a really awesome one. 
I think that's great advice. And uh, we do have Dr. Kara's email address up on the screen right now, so do take a moment to jot that down. Otherwise, we will be sending these slides out to everyone on the webinar so you can grab it at that time, but it might not be for a few days. So if you want to get in touch sooner than later, just take a minute to jot that down now. All right, I think that's about all the time we have for today. We're right at 1 o'clock now. So I'd like to thank Kara so much for that fabulous presentation and to thank all of our participants today for joining us and engaging in a really great discussion. Uh, now I'm just going to ask that you please do not close the window just yet. Please wait until you've been redirected to the Level 3 lobby screen. Once you see that screen, then it's safe to close the window and a brief evaluation survey will launch in your web browser. We'd really appreciate if you could take a few moments to give us some feedback so we can continue to offer high quality webinars. For more information about the Fall Prevention Community of Practice, please visit us on Loop at fallsloop.com. Loop is a free online communication platform for fall prevention practitioners. It's really great if you haven't checked it out already, please do so. Again, it's fallsloop.com or shoot loop en français. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Dr. Kara. Thank you, everyone on the line. Thank you, Marguerite, for helping with the webinar technology today. Have a wonderful day, and we'll see you next time.